The Irishman is here. The Irishman is here to take all your guineas money. No, not that one. Are you talking to me? Or that one. Sorry? Yes, that one. Martin Scorsese's latest film, based off the book I Heard You Paint Houses, tells the story of Frank the Irishman Sheeran, an alleged hitman for the Buffalino crime family who, just months before his death, confessed to the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. But did he actually do it? And what details did the film change or leave out? In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into the ending and the real-life mobsters who shaped Frank's life. But to understand the ending, one must first go to the beginning. In fact, this is the first shot. We, the viewer, in a darkened hallway, almost as if we're in a dark theater, about to be told a tale from the film's protagonist, Frank Sheeran. In fact, the floating point of view shot here suggests we're looking at this from Charles Brandt's perspective. But who's Charles Brandt? Well, he's the former private investigator who wrote the book the movie is based on, and to whom Frank confessed. We are him, about to meet Frank, who's going to tell us his life story. For Frank, this is his way at seeking some sort of redemption, although in my humble opinion, it's too little too late. The final shot of him is sad, him small, framed between an almost closed door, just like his life, which is soon coming to an end. For those of you wondering, he died in 2003 at the age of 83, refusing to eat following his final videotape confession. It's estimated that he killed over two dozen people, even more if you count his time in the war. Alone in the old folks' cafeteria, we get a glimpse of two important accessories. Frank's watch and ring, a symbol of the two most important relationships in his life. The ring he got from Russell Buffalino and the watch from Jimmy Hoffa. These two men shaped his life, made him do terrible things, and yet he still wears these pieces. But why? Let's start with Russell Buffalino, portrayed by Joe Pesci in his best work since Home Alone. <laughs> Born Rosario Alberto Buffalino, Russell became head of the Northeastern Buffalino crime family in Pennsylvania, which he ruled from 1959 to 1989. The Buffalinos had strong ties to the National Cosa Nostra Criminal Society, another name for the Mafia. This is depicted through his strong relationship with Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the underboss of the Genovese crime family which ruled over much of New York and Philadelphia. The ring which he gives to Frank the night of his Teamsters Man of the Year award is a symbol of his trust, and only three people have it. Him, Angelo Bruno, and now Frank. Angelo Bruno, portrayed by Harvey Keitel, was the head of one of Philadelphia's crime families. He was known as the Gentle Don because he preferred conciliation over violence, even though he was later killed by a shotgun blast in the back of the head. Three people have this ring, and you know what Frank says about three people? Usually, three people can keep a secret only when two of them are dead. Writer Steve Zalian precedes the ring scene with Frank receiving his gold watch from Jimmy Hoffa. It's not a coincidence these two scenes are put back to back. Two different gifts from people he considers father figures. He even says that receiving this award from Jimmy is, quote, the highlight of his life. So the highlight of your life isn't getting married or having kids? That's gotta hurt if you're part of his family. And the toll his work takes on his family, especially his daughter Peggy, is evident. As a child, Peggy never got along with Russell, even though Russell tried his best to make her happy. I get the feeling she don't like me, like she's afraid of me. Perhaps she could sense something bad about him, about the things he made her father do. Jimmy, on the other hand, is adored by her. She even does a grade school paper about how he and the union help working families. In her eyes, Jimmy is a good man. He may be a bit corrupt, but at the end of the day, he's helping the working man. That's why when his death is announced, she knows it's her father who did it. Frank not immediately calling Jimmy's wife after the news is all she needs to know to put two and two together. From that day on, as Frank describes, she ceased talking to him. Later on in life, Frank visits her at her job only for her to walk away. His daughter has completely disowned him. Later, when he talks to his other daughter, Dolores, he has the opportunity to open up and be honest, to ask for forgiveness, but he doesn't. He does apologize for being a bad father, saying he was just trying to protect them, but he's oblivious to the extent of damage he's already caused gonna come to you for protection because of the terrible things that you would do. Ironically, Frank's need to protect his children became the thing they feared most from him. This is encapsulated in the scene where Frank finds out the grocery store owner pushed Peggy. He brings her to the store to watch him beat the crap out of him. The event, however, that defines Frank's life is the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, a man who gave Frank his first big job and would later make him president of one of his local unions. The real Jimmy Hoffa was in fact involved with organized crime. The movie going over much 
of his hatred for John F. Kennedy, whose brother Bobby, then Attorney General of the United States, was trying to bring him down. He hated the Kennedys so much that after John's assassination, he orders the Teamsters Union not to fly the flag at half-mast. This hatred for Kennedy was not well-liked by the Mafia, who supported Kennedy since they thought a counter-revolution in Cuba, led by a Kennedy-supported U.S., may get their casinos back in Havana. Jimmy mysteriously disappeared in 1975 while waiting to have a meeting with Anthony Provenzano and Anthony Giacalone. Sorry for how bad my Italian pronunciations are. But unlike the film, which offers one version as to what happened to Jimmy, his case is still considered unsolved. The last person to have any contact with him was his unofficial appointment secretary, Louis Linto, who he called from a payphone to vent his frustration while the two Tonys were an hour late. The next day, his unlocked car was found in the parking lot, and to this day, his body has never been recovered. Odder still is the next morning, when Hoffa's wife told her daughter he was missing, the daughter told Told her that she had a vision that he was already dead wearing a dark colored short sleeve polo, just like what he's wearing in the film version. Not mentioned in the film is the confession of another hitman, Richard Kuklinski, also known as the Iceman, who claims to have killed Hoffa by putting his body in a barrel and crushing it along with used car parts into a metal cube before shipping it off to Japan. There is, however, no evidence to back this claim. Former New York mobster Michael Francese in a 2019 interview claimed to know where Hoffa's body is as well as the identity of the shooter, stating that the hit was mafia related and that Hoffa's body is quote, somewhere very wet and that the shooter is still alive but currently in prison. Frank's story, the one we see in the film, has Hoffa's murder occurring in a house in Detroit, but when investigators examined bloodstains found in that house, the results did not match Hoffa's. Why would Frank kill him is another question. Why kill the man who had been so good to you who on multiple occasions professed his love? I love you, man. Frank had no other choice. The higher-ups in the crime family wanted Hoffa gone for jeopardizing their relationship with the Teamsters Union. If Hoffa had become president of the union again, it would not be good for business, not to mention all the files and dirt he has on the mafia. Jimmy had to go, and it's heavily implied that Frank was to go too. But it was Russell who intervened on his behalf, with the crime family agreeing to let Frank live if he was the one to pull the trigger. The only reason they agreed to this is out of respect to me. But you and Rini will be okay. This all goes back to protection. How far are you willing to go to protect those you love? Frank didn't have to go through with it, but doing so would put him and his family in the Mafia's crosshairs. But it's not just one decision that totally changed his life. It was a series of decisions, starting with some small-time steak stealing. This led to him doing bigger crimes, like almost blowing up a linen warehouse, which he didn't know his pal Angelo Bruno partly owned. This led to him killing a man named Whispers, and this event became the gateway for him to take on more and more hits for the mob. Frank's decision to do these things were driven by money, money he needed for his family. The only thing is, you got more kids, you gotta earn more, more money. In turn, Frank ended up neglecting his family, leaving his first wife and scarring his children who lived in constant fear. His wife died of lung cancer, but I guess that makes sense considering all the smoke breaks they took. Essentially, Frank is left all alone. Russell, who he ends up spending time with in prison, is depicted in the film as dying after attending, quote, church. And knowing how these guys have code words like painting houses, it can be assumed to die. In real life, however, he was released from prison in the late 80s, where he later died in hospital at the age of 90. Russell's post-prison life, which acts as an epilogue to the film, deals with Frank coming to terms with his life. We've already seen how his family has disowned him, and now that he's failed his family, his own body is failing him as well. He goes to pick out his own casket, a green one fitting for an Irishman. He chooses a plot in the crypt number 1948, the same year he began working for Russell. He talks about choosing to be buried over cremation, saying, That's the hardest part of anybody when they berries is when they go into the ground because it's, it's so final. He's concerned being cremated is too final, but perhaps his fear of the finality of death has not so much to do with death itself, but dying before one's story is told. There's something still on his conscience, thus his eventual decision to confess his story. Going back to this idea of being buried is encapsulated in the scene where Frank, as a World War II soldier, makes his captors dig their own graves before killing them. Frank, metaphorically, is just like these soldiers, digging his own grave by the decisions he makes throughout the film. Hell, he even gets to choose his own casket. It's crazy, but I never understood how they would just keep digging. 
their own graves, you know. When the federal agents come and ask him who he's protecting by remaining silent, they tell him everyone around him is dead. All the people that once could bring harm to his family are gone. He confesses, although not every detail, to a priest, with arguably one of the most cryptic lines of the film. What kind of a man makes a, a, a phone call like that? He's referring to the heartbreaking call he had with Jimmy's wife, one in which he stutters uncontrollably. He's supposed to be the one consoling, yet he looks like the one who should be consoled. It's pathetic, sad, and this line sums up his guilt. Frank is surprised that the nurse has no idea who Jimmy Hoffa is, a man he says was more well known in the 60s than the Beatles. If no one remembers Jimmy, who will remember him? In fact, when the priest says a prayer absolving him of his sins, a scene that is implied happens after his confession to Charles Brandt, the priest informs him that Christmas is coming up. But Frank is oblivious. He has no family to celebrate with. He has lost everything. The final shot is a sad portrayal of a man whose life has turned to tragedy of his own doing, a life that's soon to be closed, just like that door. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked this video, please leave a like and let me know what you thought of The Irishman in the comments below. I'll be coming up with more videos, so make sure to subscribe with that bell on, and you can also follow me on Twitter at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.